or in chapter 12 this morning, we see that there is evidence that some of the church members were apparently not happy with the spiritual gifts that they were given. They, wanting more attention brought to themselves, some were seeking after gifts that God did not give them. And because of that, the body suffered. Uh, the gifts that they did not have, they were exercising those things and really ignoring the gifts that they, that they did have. So it appears also that some may have even been exercising counterfeit gifts, uh, fake gifts, claiming tongues that were not tongues, claiming words of knowledge that really were their own words or thoughts, and claiming prophecy that really wasn't Prophecy, And I don't think it's any coincidence that Paul says in the following chapter, chapter 13, Paul says that prophecy will fail, tongues will cease, and knowledge will vanish away. So the division in the Corinthian church as we go along just seems to get worse and, and worse and worse. So Paul here is trying to uh, bring them together uh, in unity, and that's largely what this sermon is about avoiding division and promoting unity. So these abuses of the spiritual gifts were causing problems. These selfish desires were starting to take their toll on the Corinthian church. And the apostle writes these words, building up to chapter 13, which we know as uh, the love chapter, where he reminds the church that love does not envy. It is not self-seeking. It is not prideful or puffed up. Since in their pursuit of the more showy gifts, some of the Corinthians were seeking to glorify themselves rather than to glorify God by being content with the gifts that God gave them. So let's start reading 1 Corinthians 12, uh, starting with verse 14. He says, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, Am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. So the psalmist wrote in 139, Psalm 139, about the human body. The psalmist says, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Fearfully and wonderfully made. In Genesis chapter one, when God created the sun, the moon, and the stars, you remember what he said? It is good. When he created the fish and the birds of the air, he repeated that statement, it is good. And after he would create, he kept saying, it is good, it is good, it is good. The Lord did not say it is very good, however, until after he made mankind. So the human body was made by God, and God made it exactly the way he wanted it. So it is with Christ's body, the church. So for someone to put down a part of the body of Christ, a member of the body of Christ, to put down that which God has made, that is an offense against God. Or if someone is to have contempt towards a particular part or member of the body which God has blessed, that is an assault against the unity of the body. Paul continues, starting in verse 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. I think it's safe to say that no person would be willing to just give up their hand or give up their foot or give up an eye. Nobody would do that. Now, could someone live without one of those body parts? Yes, you could live without uh, some of these body parts, but things are going to be that much more difficult. 
Can the church operate without some of the spiritual gifts? Yes, but again, it'll be that much more difficult. So there are churches that have some gifts and not others. Uh, for example, there may be a church that has great preaching, but the people lack mercy. Uh, there are churches where the gift of mercy is present, but nobody has the gifts of uh, help. So when something needs to be done, nobody's there to do it. Uh, there may be churches that have all of those gifts, but they don't have the gift of administration. So there's always an element of, of chaos present. So the church needs every member functioning ministering their spiritual gifts in order for the church to be both effective and efficient. So God has given each believer here a spiritual gift and each one should be ministering whatever gift God has given you and not be upset because God hasn't given me that gift that could maybe elevate me or I could show it off. And that's kind of what the uh, Corinthians were doing. Uh, just another comment about the the human body, no human being would sever a body part just because, for no reason. That would be insanity, would it not? Nobody would do that. And yet the Corinthians, they were showing antipathy towards certain parts of the body. They were showing that towards certain people that were less important, people who had inferior spiritual gifts, or so they thought. Why did they think that the people were less important? Why did they think that these gifts were inferior? Simply because they were done behind the scenes. Uh, tongues was a gift that was uh, not behind the scenes. It was done publicly. It's a speaking gift. So the gift of tongues brings a lot of attention, right? If someone starts speaking in tongues, that sort of attracts attention and attracts uh, a crowd, as you can imagine. Also, uh, preaching. Now, that's a speaking gift. It's done publicly. It's a very important gift. And Paul acknowledges this in chapter 14. What does Paul call preaching in chapter 14? He calls it prophesying. And we could get into the difference between uh, prophecy in the first century and preaching today. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Paul says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy. So declaring God's truth, preaching is a very, very important gift. No question about it. So let's consider for a moment if a church had great preaching, but this church lacked love, lacked mercy. This church had great preaching, sound doctrine that was both encouraging and, and challenging. Uh, it was challenging, it was deep, uh, the deep truths were conveyed, but the simplicity of the gospel was still, was still there. But what if that church with great preaching had uh, people who just lacked mercy, they lacked love? What would that look like? The preaching might grab people's attention, might bring people in, but then after a while, once people are in the church, they realize that everybody there is just uh, kind of a, just a bunch of jerks because nobody's showing love towards one another. What good is the great preaching at that point? So it's very important to have all the spiritual gifts, have them active. That is what the Lord wants. That is how he designed the body. It is a fact that no spirit-filled believer, <clears throat> no spirit-filled Christian would speak against another who has a spiritual gift that they seem to be less, less important. Uh, Spirit-filled people don't do that. Uh, there's a lot of gifts that are done behind the scenes, aren't there? Matter of fact, maybe most of the gifts are done behind the scenes. We're thankful at this church to have people who do what? Maybe uh, prepare meals, clean the church, work on the church building. Uh, they help people with their everyday needs during the week. They visit hospitals and nursing homes, and you don't know anything about it. They give to missionaries out of their own pockets above and beyond the tithe. They give encouragement to people who need it. And all the while, you don't know that this is going on because they're not sounding the trumpet every time they do a good work. We thank God for those people. What an offense against the unity of the body to have the attitude, well, that stuff isn't that important because it's not up front and center. 
It's a terrible attitude, and yet that's what was going on within the Corinthian church. Paul says in verse 22, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Take a look at verse 23. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part that lacks it. What is Paul talking about here? Uh, One Bible commentator uh, said this. He said the quote-unquote less honorable parts of the body, these are the parts that are concealed by clothing. Okay, but nevertheless, these are the parts uh, that perform some of the necessary and most important functions of the body. So the greater honor, therefore, refers to the greater attention, labor, and care given to these parts of the body. Other commentators view this as Paul referencing the internal organs. You know, if you think about it, uh, the internal organs, you don't see them. You never see them. You go throughout your day and don't even think about them, and yet they are perhaps the most important parts of the body that sustain life. Either way, Paul says in verses 25 and 26 that there should be no schism in the body. What does that mean, schism? Division. There should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Uh, The Greek word translated here, schism, is translated elsewhere as uh, division. A schismatic is somebody, through their words or actions, they cause division or even a church split. Some people here have probably been through a church Split, And that is a painful, painful thing. The Corinthian church was still together at this point, but this was a real risk. And the devil, make no mistake about it, the devil wants to split churches, doesn't he? If the devil can split a church, that's a, that's a real victory for him. And that seems to be his strategy, divide and conquer. So if you would, turn to the book of First Kings, 1 Kings chapter 11. Division often happens in the church when someone or a group of people demand to get their way. Usually that's that's what happens. A group of people demand to get their way. They put their own interests first and they do things to exalt themselves and their own ideas, usually at the expense of of other people. Uh, We've been in the New Testament, so let's go back to see uh, some division in the Old Testament. Uh, This is the story about the division or the schism that happened between Israel and Judah. Just a little context. You remember uh, King Saul, he was the first king of Israel. King David was the next king. And David ruled over the United Kingdom of Israel, all 12 uh, tribes. When David died, however, he left the kingdom to his son Solomon. And Solomon, who the Bible says is the wisest man who ever lived, or at least up until that point, uh, you remember that Solomon, and you know, sometimes I wonder about that statement, because we know that Solomon, and and I believe the Bible says that I believe it, okay? But uh, Solomon, as you know, had what? 700 wives and 300 concubines. Does that sound like the wisest man on earth to you? I don't know. It doesn't sound all that wise to me. And the scripture says that these women, or the foreign women, led his heart away from the Lord. Look at 1 Kings 11, verses 11 and 12. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. So his son who took the throne was named Rehoboam. 
The servant who split the kingdom, took the 12 tribes to the north, his name was Jeroboam. Uh, that name Jeroboam uh, lived on in infamy. Now flip over to chapter 12, and we'll see the events that led up to this schism in Israel. And we already saw that it was largely due to Solomon marrying all these foreign wives, which God strictly commanded his people not to do. And you think about it, his sin had great consequences upon his son and upon his son's sons. And it just kind of went on and on and on. Of course, Solomon was the result of what? David and his union with Bathsheba. You know, sometimes people will do something. They'll rebel against God. They'll commit a sin. They'll say, well, I'll handle the consequences. I know I shouldn't do this, but I'll deal with it. You know what? Your children are going to deal with it. And your grandchildren are going to deal with it. So we need to remember what we do just doesn't affect us. It affects other people, in particular, our children. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, for he was still in Egypt, he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, been dwelling in Egypt, that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Speaking about Solomon, he made their yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father in his heavy yoke, which he has put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. He needed a little time to consider this, which is a wise thing to do, uh, but that wisdom doesn't last. Verse 4, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived, and he said, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him who stood before him. So that's his first mistake. Verse 9, and he said to them, what advice do you get? Speaking to the young men, how should we answer this people who have spoken to me saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him saying, thus you shall speak to this people who have spoken to you saying your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, you ready? My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. You know, Solomon may have been the wisest man who ever lived, but that wisdom was not transferred to his son, obviously. So because of this, the kingdom of Israel was divided. You had Israel, the 10 tribes to the north, and you had Judah to the south. Now skip down to verse 19, where we read what is really a sad Sad statement. And so has been, and Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And that was written a few thousand years ago. And what's even sadder, who was the throne transferred to? Today, who occupies the throne? The Lord Jesus Christ. And Israel continues to live in rebellion to Christ to this day to this day. So what led to this schism in Israel? Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, demanded that the people do more work, more taxes, and instead of showing them kindness and speaking to them 
with grace and compassion, he spoke roughly. You know, Rehoboam, he appeared to care about one person. And who is that person? Himself. Himself. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Just going to see something here in Philippians 2 that will really promote unity. We want to avoid the foolish decisions. We want to avoid trying to exalt ourselves. And Philippians 2 gives us some good advice. Because some of the Corinthians, they wanted prominence. They wanted to magnify themselves. And if it was at the expense of other people, so be it. And that is a recipe for division. Okay, Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So what are we supposed to do? Put other people before ourselves. Instead of considering what you want, consider what somebody else wants. What did Jesus say? He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And he said, to deny self. And I think we know that selfishness, that comes naturally, doesn't it? I mean, this is part of the fallen nature. You know, looking out for number one, right? That's just sort of a phrase that people live by. So we need to resist that instead of indulge it. Uh, walk in the spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh. And be a giver not just a taker. Uh, Paul goes on in Philippians 2 to talk about Jesus, who was God incarnate, and yet he took upon himself the form of a servant. Remember, he was washing his disciples' feet, a very humbling act. And it was because of this, the fact that Christ was obedient even unto death, humbling himself, even the death of the cross, it's because of that that God the Father highly exalted Jesus and gave him the name that is above every name. Those in heaven will bow, those on the earth will bow, and those under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father because he humbled himself before God. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. If someone is proud, if somebody has to always have their way, they get upset when they don't get their way, what's going to happen? Well, it'll leave a bad taste in other people's mouth. It'll cause division in the church, and uh, it's not going to cause God to exalt you. On the other hand, if someone's meek and, and humble, they're always looking out for someone else, they're selfless instead of selfish, that's going to be a good testimony. And even if people don't exalt that person, God will. Who would you rather be exalted by? Other people or God? God forbid we should exalt ourselves. We want to be exalted by God. Now let's address the last uh, few verses of chapter 12. Go back to 1 Corinthians. The last few verses are uh, very, very significant. Paul says, starting in verse 27, and remember this now, he says, you are the body of Christ and members individually. 1 Corinthians 12. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. And he says in verse 29, and think about what he's saying here. He's asking a question, sort of. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. 
And that excellent way is what we're going to look at next week in 1 Corinthians 13. Again, has been dubbed the love chapter. So these, the apostles, prophets, teachers, they are the gifts and other things. They are the gifts that God has given to the church. For what? We talked about this in, in Sunday school. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith. And I think it's implied in that statement that we're never actually going to come to the full unity until we see Christ in glory. But until then, we can strive for unity. In the local church, we can have a great deal of unity. Even the Corinthians were capable of it. They just weren't doing the right things at the moment. So the Corinthians were capable but why does Paul put it this way? Why does he ask these questions? Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Well, he's asking uh, rhetorical questions, isn't he? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Are all apostles? No. no. Are all prophets? No. no. Are all teachers? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. All right, so right there you see that uh, Pentecostal doctrine that you must speak in tongues to be saved, that all God's people are to speak in tongues. You can see that's not true based on this statement. Uh, and I like how the New Living Translation puts verse 31. Uh, it says, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. You see, you don't need to be an apostle to be important. You don't need to be a prophet or a pastor teacher to be a vital part of the church. You don't need to be up front and center to be an important member of the body. Uh, before we close, this is very important to uh, address. Paul, as an apostle, he spoke with the highest level of authority. I think everyone understands that. He wrote scripture. Paul was an apostle. He spoke with this high, high level of authority. The prophets, who were they? They were gifted preachers in the early church who along with the apostles laid the foundation of the church. Uh, that's what we read in Ephesians chapter two, that the church is uh, based on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So that's the foundation, which was laid when? Last year? 100 years ago? No, 2,000 years ago. That's when the foundation was laid, right? And you remember what Paul said way back in chapter 3? Do you remember that far back, 1 Corinthians 3? What did he say? He said, I laid the foundation and another will build on it. So the apostles and prophets laid the foundation of the church. And for the last 1,900 years, pastors and teachers have been building on that solid foundation. But we need to be careful about how we build. So the church, because of this work, has now spread out to cover the entire earth. It's amazing when you think about it. The origins of the church, just uh, 12 men in the land of Israel. 12 men in their Messiah, Jesus. And now the church covers the entire globe. So the church, because of this work, we are in the process of fulfilling the great commission to make disciples of all the nations. And you remember what Jesus said? I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Have there been some bumps in the road along the way? Yeah, there has. Have there been some schisms and divisive people that have divided some churches? Unfortunately, yes. Are God's people perfect? No, but we do serve a perfect Savior. So our unity is in him. Our unity is in the word of God. Our unity is in the gospel. So in conclusion, you know, we're reading about all the problems the Corinthians have. And every local church has some level of of problems, but don't get discouraged because there is unity within the universal church, if not the local church. Every individual church has some problems. Why? Because people have problems. And you know what? When a part of the body, when a member of the body 
goes through problems, our reaction shouldn't be to judge that person, it should be to help that person. So don't lose sight of the fact that we are part of something special, something powerful, and something eternal. As Paul says here in chapter 12, you are the body of Christ.